Associate Director of the Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern Studies, and uh, we're very happy to have with us today Rawia Taufik uh, for a, a lecture on Arab, Afro-Arab relations from the common struggle to the new uh, scramble. I, before I introduce everybody, uh, I did want to thank the Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora, uh, with whom we collaborated on this and made our nice uh, lunch spread po uh, possible. I'm, uh, you know, I hope you've all gotten a chance to get some food. Uh, and so let me uh, introduce uh, Rawia Taufik. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the Faculty of Economics and Political Science at Cairo University. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy and Politics from the University of Oxford and a Master's in Science from the polit in Politics from Cairo University. Her research interests include uh, issues surrounding African development and regional integration, Nile Hydro polit politics, and the foreign policy of region regional powers in Africa. She was a visiting research fellow at the Sa South African Institute of International Affairs and the African Study Institute or African Institute of South Africa, uh, and a researcher at the German Development Institute. Uh, the well, I could say it in German, but that's fine. My German is terrible. <laughs> uh, she received a, a number. She has received a, a number of prestigious awards and research grants, including uh, the individual research grant uh, of the African Peacebuilding Network in 2017. Some representatives from SSRC who award that uh, fellowship are with us today. And the Presidential Fellowship from the African Studies Association for this year. And that is uh, part of the reason why we're so lucky to have her here at the African Studies Association uh, is meeting this week. This week. This week. Excellent. Uh, Raleigh is going to lecture for uh, about 45 minutes to an hour. And then we are also uh, lucky to have a respondent with us today, uh, Professor Zvi Bendor. Uh, and he is NYU's Associate Vice Chancellor for the Global Network Faculty Planning, as well as a professor in the History Departments of History and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, where he specializes in teaching courses on Asian history uh, during and after the Mongol period and Islam in the world. He studied Chinese history in Jerusalem and in China and later at UCLA, where he completed his PhD in early modern history. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for coming, and without any further ado, I want to I hand it off to uh, Raoul Taufik. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ryan. I think you can hear me at the back, right? Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ryan, for uh, organizing this, this event. Thank you, Professor Bento, for accepting to uh, discuss my presentation. Uh, I should also thank the African Peace Building Network at the Social Science Research Council for uh, uh, supporting my visit and, and my nomination for the um, uh, Presidential Fellow for the African Studies Association this year. Um, today I'll be talking about um, Afro-Arab relations and the uh, trace, the development of, of these relations in, in, in the last uh, six decades. Um, I'll be starting by a background why I'm interested in, in this topic and how. Uh, then move to a theoretical introduction of how to approach these relations, how these relations uh, were researched uh, by different African, Arab, and, and, and Western scholars, and then uh, start by uh, uh, describing how these relations looked like after independence of the 1950s and 1960s, especially focusing on the, uh, the, the the, the narrative of the golden age of, of Afro-Arab relations and Afro-Arab solidarity, and whether this was really, you know, a golden age or a or a start of of a, of a <coughs> link of, of patronage between Africa and the Arab world, um, and then move to the 1980s and 1990s, discuss the indicators and reasons of, of Arab disengagement from Africa, if you can call it that way, and then uh, in the last two decades, I'll be describing the uh, the sort of relations as moving from collectivism to, to uh, bilateralism. So we can actually no longer speak about Afro-Arab relations as such, but about bilateral relations that are driven by specific, uh, um, as I will also say, short-term interest. Um, uh, so I'll be speaking about the tools uh, of these bilateralism, the new agenda, and also the international and regional uh, context. But my, my, I have a kind of a long-term interest in, in the topic, uh, but some of the milestones um, have been a research project that I coordinated for the um, uh, African Institute of South Africa in Pretoria, and the, the center was basically interested in, in, in North African integration and how North Africa integrates into the 
the, the wider continent, and the result was a book that was published a few years ago on bridging the North Sub-Saharan divide. That includes a collection of you know, uh, books that look at historical, economic, and political aspect of the Afro-Arab relations. And then my recent work has been focused on another connection between North and Sub-Saharan Africa, basically uh, a hydropolitics of the Nile Basin, the changing hydropolitical relations between Egypt, um, particularly between either Egypt and Ethiopia, but between Egypt and, and Sudan also as downstream countries and uh, uh, upstream countries led, led, led by Ethiopia. Uh, so I've published on, on, on this issue and uh, um, uh, done research uh, last year on the potentials of regional integration between Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, and Sudan, the Eastern Nile, and that was supported by the African uh, Peace Building Network. Uh, and then forthcoming is also a joint uh, uh, chapter that I, I, I co-authored with, with Anna Kaskow and, and Mark Zaytoun on the connections between the Nile Basin and uh, um, the Nile Basin Horn of Africa and uh, the Gulf, and I'll be speaking more about that uh, in my presentation. Now, how this topic of, of Afro relations was approached? I mean, looking at, at, at different, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of literature on, on the topic, I kind of divided this literature into basically three approaches. One that we can call the Afro uh, Arab nationalist approach uh, is one that basically emphasize the uh, solidarity between the two regions, the two groups, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, as I will be speaking about in a minute. Um, it, it also uh, look at both groups, and, and this is, I think, one of the problems of, of this approach. Uh, it's very much looking at both groups, both Arabs and Africans, as victims of the international system. So it's focusing very much at the international level of analysis and kind of ignoring the, the agency of both the Africans and the Arab region in the world system, um, even with the rising power of you know, China, Brazil, and India, um, they actually, uh, uh, I mean, this kind of literature, see that, well, African countries, Arab countries, have not actually uh, made, uh, I mean, they've not tried to make use of, of the, the rise of these powers. So more or less, the, the two regions, according to this literature, are marginalized, and the way to enhance their positions in the international system is through a project of regional integration between um, the Africans and the Arab world. Um, a, a quote from a, a diplomat at the um, um, Arab League uh, is actually kind of indicating this kind of aspired regional integration project. is basically saying, well, that this is a necessity. This is a must. You know, a Arab regional integration project is a must in a globalized world that is characterized by, by regionalism. Well, another approach is what I can call a historical cultural approach that very much focus on the differences rather than the common history. So a number of African scholars will see the history of African Arab relations as one of differentiation on, on you know, historical and cultural uh, lines, focusing very much on the history that cannot be denied of, uh, of, of the Arabs in, in, in slave trade in Africa, the so-called historical you know, expansionist um, um, Arab Islamic approach, uh, a project in, in Africa, starting from the 7th century up to the 15th century, and the Arabs' attitudes of superiority uh, 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 towards Africans, and that are manifest or evident, in, especially in borderline countries, from, from Sudan to Mauritania. And one interesting argument also they are trying to make, and I will come to that in, in, in my presentation, is how Arab internal or regional conflicts are actually being exported to Africa, making unnecessary divisions among Africans themselves. One example that they use a lot is the Arab Israeli conflict and how actually this was exported to, to Africans. And uh, finally, how the Africans were uh, disappointed uh, uh, from the Arab support to, uh, to African development in the 1960s and 1970s. So these are the issues that this body of literature is, is, is making. And then a third approach will be looking at this relationship as a, a model of what's called extraversion. So, so a number of Western scholars will see the African-Arab relations as a model of how African countries are using the, their domestic uh, the, the foreign policies to uh, mobilize financial resources in order to maintain their domestic control. And this is uh, an interesting you know, body of literature that is linking domestic and, and, and foreign policy. Um, so the, 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 in, in this context, referring to how the Arabs are seeing Africa at the hinterland, the sphere of influence for the, for the you know, uh, uh, um, 
prestige or you know, uh, um, you know, international adventures sometimes, and how Africans see the Arab world as a source of political, but basically of financial support. And here is uh, here comes the, the 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 relationship of patronage between between the two regions. And in that context, the relationship is being seen or described as a relation of necessity or driven by necessity. Okay, so each side needs something from the, the, the other side. Uh, the, the Arabs, as I said, uh, provide financial support occasionally to, to African countries, uh, but these are, these are all, uh, only occasional you know, uh, uh, support, as I, as I mentioned. And they get involved occasionally in a way that sometimes, as I will illustrate, they stabilize uh, the uh, African um, uh, uh, you know, continent in general and the whole of Africa in particular, as I will focus in my presentation. And as a kind of a, a way of summing up these approaches, I think Mazrui put it um, quite eloquently um, uh, more than four decades ago when he said, well, that Arabs, has, uh, Arabs have been both conquerors and liberators of Africa. And the question now, I think he was I mean, raising this question more than four decades ago, but, but, but it's still relevant now, is whether the Arabs can transform their relationship with African countries into a partnership that can contribute to development and it can also add to peace in, in, um, in African countries in general and the direct neighborhood of the Arabs in the whole of Africa in particular. And what I'll be doing in my presentation is try to touch on the three approaches actually because in my own point of view, uh, an approach to take into consideration the complexity of the relationship has to first of all start from history and not be talking too much about the history of the relationship between uh, the two regions because I'm, I'm not a historian, but I believe that this has, uh, I mean, the discussion has to put into con consideration the historical sensitivity, the historical problems of relations between the two regions, and the weight of, of these dilemmas, historical dilemmas of the, on the current relation. I'll be touching on that briefly in my presentation. It has to take into consideration the international context. Uh, uh, well, the, the relations between the two regions are not happening in a vacuum, and the international context actually affects heavily the type of relation as I, as I will also illustrate. And then finally, one has to take into consideration the domestic politics in both regions, how foreign policies are used in uh, both regions to uh, uh, serve some uh, domestic ends, and how the character of domestic politics, especially the role of big men, uh, uh, is actually uh, being, uh, uh, you know, um, is, is affecting the sort of relations between, between the two regions. So to start with, the first, as I said, I'm not going to start with the you know, post-independence period, and who again, this is a clear example of, of the, the role of big men, the role of, of leaders. Um, the, the, the period in the 1950s and 1960s, right after, after independence, is being described in, in, in different ways. So, uh, um, Gamal Nkrumah was the son of, of Kwame Nkrumah, probably one of these uh, guys here. Uh, um, um, have actually has actually described that as a gold uh, as the golden age of Afro Arab relation, the age of solidarity between the two countries, and unity against colonialism, um, um, against imperialism, and against uh, segregation, especially you know, racial segregation in, in, in Southern Africa. Um, and, and, and on the other hand, we have, uh, as I said, I mean, an approach that sees that at the beginning of the relationship of patronage between the, between uh, the two regions. So we have a kind of a mixed picture. On the one hand, we have countries in North Africa, Egypt, Algeria in particular, who actually lend their support to uh, sub-Saharan African countries, to liberation movements in these countries. On the other hand, uh, we had a, you know, a, a pan-Africanist view in sub-Saharan Africa uh, held by leaders like Nkrumah, though he sometimes raised you know, the, the, you know, the debate of whether Egypt is committed more towards the African continent and more towards the world, but he generally had this pan-Africanist view that did not divide North and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we had also, which is um, an interesting argument uh, uh, made by Mazrouri, that well, the, the, the African interest in you know, supporting the Arab coast, supporting the Palestinian issue and the, 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 you know, uh, against Israel, was not only seeking for seeking financial support, but it was also foreseeing the link between, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the new uh, state of Israel and, you know, uh, uh, white settlers in, in, in South Africa and Southern Africa in general. So there was this unease which actually uh, 
uh, kind of both Africans and Arabs together against you know imperialist sub imperialist uh, powers in in the region and the world. And in this context, we have seen I mean and this is historically documented African countries supporting. Uh, Egypt and, uh, uh, and other Arab countries in 1967, war 1973, um, breaking off the, the relation with, with Israel uh, after the 1973 war, and also solidarity from, uh, from uh, um, uh, Arabs against apartheid that uh, was evident in the Arab economic boycott and, and oil embargo against uh, apartheid South Africa, but also against Rhodesia and, and Portugal in the mid-1970s. It was in this period also that the Arabs started setting up uh, um, um, institutions and tools and funds for supporting African development. So uh, the most uh, notable of which was the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, which dispersed about one billion US dollars in the first decade from 1975 when it was first established until 1985 in terms of loans, uh, grants, and, and, and technical support. So there was this kind of political and economic support that actually cemented relations between the two regions. Um, and then there was a milestone of the uh, first Arab, uh, Arab summit that was held in 1977 in Cairo. And here, scholars speak about that as a, as a turning point that actually shifted or transformed the relations from one of solidarity, political solidarity, basically, to one of cooperation, sitting institution, regular institution. Of course, they were never regular. But setting regular institutions of, of cooperation, some of that should have you know, been convened every, every three years, and institutions at different you know, official levels in order to institutionalize the relationship between, between the two uh, regions. But of course, this does not mean that, well, the relations were not problematic. Of course, as uh, one of the approaches that I illustrated in the, the beginning of my talk uh, pointed out, there were many frustrations, especially at the African side. So there were frustrations, first of all, uh, from the level of, of financial support uh, from aid, Arab aid to, to Africa, which never actually compensated for the rise of, of, uh, of oil uh, prices in the, the mid-1970s. Uh, there was also a kind of uh, occasional you know, uh, criticism to what uh, the Nigerian, the Nigerian uh, foreign minister once uh, called uh, call, uh, uh, occasional patronizing attitudes from Arabs towards, towards the Africans, and the fact that, well, most official and non-official Arab aid went actually to Muslim uh, majority countries in Africa rather than to other countries, which actually gave kind of a negative signal of, of, of the relations at the, you know, at the collective level. 1980s and 1990s, uh, we can call these the decades of disengagement. And again, here we have to call the international and, and regional context and how this context shaped this relationship. But, so the, the, the start was, was the, the uh, decline in oil prices, which affected the Arab financial support to Africa. But then, in the end of the 1970s and 1980s, there were a number of factors uh, in, in the Arab world that actually affected this collective relationship between the two regions. Starting from the Egypt's peace with Israel, which kind of drove it away from both the Arab world and Africa, and then a military confrontation <coughs> between Libya and Chad, the Morocco, uh, Morocco's withdrawal from the uh, Organization of African Unity for accepting the uh, uh, Sahrawi Republic in, in the organization. All these actually kind of suspended the collective institutional of Afro-Arab cooperation for decades. It only revived in 2010 when uh, the Libyan uh, uh, President Muammar Gaddafi uh, showed interest in, in reviving these institutions and held the second summit in Sirte in 2010. But then in the 1990s, there were also the you know, uh, dramatic changes uh, uh, internationally and regionally, the end of the Cold War, the so-called marginalization of Africa in the international system, which is something that is debatable, and of course the division of the Arab world itself after the, the, the Iraqi uh, invasion of Kuwait. So here we can see that the two regions are not actually becoming a collective in themselves. So then it becomes problematic to speak about you know, Arab relations with Africa in, in collectivity. Um, so that's why I mean, the, the last two decades are the decades of transformation from collectivism to, to bilateralism. And again, I mean, the, 
there are international regional contexts that um, variables that, that have shaped this relationship. Um, first of all, um, of course, there were the, the, the North African uprisings, 2010-2011, uh, and how they actually affected the uh, um, implementation of uh, decisions that were uh, you know, um, uh, agreed upon in, in CERT in 2010 in the second summit. Uh, there was the failure to establish a joint fund between the um, Arabs and Africans that was agreed upon in the third summit that was held in Kuwait in, in 2013. Although this um, uh, summit was actually uh, kind of promising in terms of transforming the relationship and you know introducing new words like partnership to give the impression that relations are, are now equal between you know, uh, you know, um, you know, partnership among equals, and there was. Of course, the, the issue that if we're speaking about collective relationship, we're speaking basically about also institutional relationship between the Arab League and the, the African Union. And both organizations, as we all know, have their own ills and have their own problems. So we cannot imagine that these ailing institutions would actually lead uh, uh, that collective you know, uh, relationship between, between the two regions. Um, one also problem was, uh, and, and this was pointed out by even by, by, by diplomats and, and officials uh, involved in, in, in this collective endeavor of uh, you know, for cooperation, that it was known that these relations were actually um, very much top down. They're driven by states, they're driven, driven by governments, even the proposal of holding an Afro Arab uh, uh, Development Forum. Um, failed to materialize. This was an opportunity to drive you know, the, the, the roles of both civil society and, and business. But so far the relations remain very much uh, um, you know, governmental official with little involvement from uh, non-governmental uh, actors. And then finally there were also social and legal constraints. Uh, that were evident in, 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 in issues like, um, like the um, African uh, labor migrants in, in Gulf countries, for instance, a very sensitive topic that uh, Arab countries decided not to uh, negotiate collectively with African countries and to keep it to bilateral relations. So all these factors actually have transformed this relations, as I said, from being collective to being bilateral. And then, in addition to that, there are also a number of important uh, international variables that we have to refer to. We have, of course, the American approach toward involvement in uh, the countries of the South, uh, especially the, the, the Middle East, some parts of the Middle East and Africa. It's, as we know, it's a selective engagement. It's one that is based on, on burden sharing, uh, sometimes even handing the burdens of, of intervention to other regional powers. We can see that in the Saudi uh, Emirati role in, 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 in Yemen but also in the role of other regional powers, including you know, Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. So uh, this is an approach that uh, uh, has, as I will illustrate, uh, very much affected uh, the, the relations between the two regions, and even the economic involvement of some uh, rising powers, including China, as we will see, in uh, hydraulic projects in the Nile Basin, and how this has a potential impact of, of destabilizing uh, uh, these regions. And Again, I mean, in, in, in terms of, of the regional context and international context, um, the, the competition, I mean, one of the reasons, uh, one of the implications of this uh, selective American engagement is competition among these powers that are given more, you know, space to act in their spheres of influence. And these divisions can be along the different lines. So as, as we can see in, in the Middle East, Sunni Shia uh, uh, divisions, divisions according to the positions from, from political Islam with Turkey, uh, Qatar on the one hand, Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the other. But the third and also problematic feature of, of this international regional contact that affected relations between um, Africa and the Arab world is the fluid alliances. And I, I will illustrate this briefly, but countries basically moving from one, side, one block to the other. Uh, we have seen that in, in cases of Sudan and Eritrea, moving from supporting Iran to supporting uh, 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 the Saudis. Um, we've seen that uh, recently with you know, the Gulf crisis, uh, moving between Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia, UAE. So this is also has a, a kind of a, a potential destabilizing factor that I would be referring to. Now, what are the new tools and the 
some of the programmatic tools of involvement of, of Arab countries uh, now at the bilateral level and emphasize and reiterate that in Africa. The first and, and, and I think most contro controversial one is the militarization of the Horn of Africa by the setting of, of you know, military bases or military presence. As you can see, I'm not sure if you can see this, this map clearly, but it's showing basically the uh, military presence of, of, um, of some international regional powers in the, re in the region. So we have different, I'll uh, not go into the details of that for the, for the interest of time, but an Emirati presence in, in Eritrea, in Somalia, but uh, more problematically in Somaliland and, and Puntland and, you know, and other regions, in self-declared regions in, in Somalia. We have you know, an agreed agreement between Saudi Arabia and, and Djibouti for hosting the Saudi military base in Djibouti. And uh, um, in addition to uh, some, you know, uh, uh, also attempts to develop some ports in the region, including in, in Eritrea and uh, Somalia and Somaliland. Um, and the interest here is, I mean, the, the kind of strategic interest um, that has increased um, uh, from the Arabs and, and specifically in the Horn of Africa is, of course, um, related to the uh, spread of the activities of, of uh, extremist movements uh, on the uh, two sides of the Red Sea, Somalia uh, on the one hand, Yemen on the other hand. It is related to not only to, to, to facing these uh, you know, uh, uh, immediate threats, but also to carving spheres of influence for countries like the UAE or so Saudi Arabia in, in this, uh, um, particularly in this region, in the home of Africa, and of course securing uh, sh shipping routes. And this was evident when uh, a few months ago, the Saudi Arabia, after attacks uh, from the Houthis in Yemen on uh, uh, Saudi ships, uh, decided to hold the, uh, um, you know, the export of its oil through uh, um, the, the Red Sea uh, for a few days. So there are kind of really uh, strategic uh, political interests for these Arab countries in, in this region. And these have different implications working in different directions. So on the one hand, we have the kind of pacifying, so to say, impact. So on the one, uh, on the one hand, we, as, as you've all uh, um, uh, noticed, the uh, Saudi role in, and the UAE role in bringing the Eritreans, the Ethiopians together to sign a peace deal. Uh, before that was, uh, as I said, the, the implications of supporting Eritrea and how this changed a bit in the balance of power, paving the way for this arrangements, for this kind of peaceful arrangements uh, in the region between Eritrea and Djibouti, Eritrea and, 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 um, and, and Somalia, and of course Eritrea and uh, Ethiopia. But we have also a kind of destabilizing impact for the ongoing Gulf crisis between Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia, UAE. Um, why? Because as I mentioned, I mean, in some kind of fragile states, if you look at the case of, of Somalia, for instance, and how it, it, there has been you know, great pressures on Somalia in order to shift its alliance uh, from, uh, from Qatar uh, and Turkey to uh, Saudi Arabia using the Czech book diplomacy to uh, impact its role. And how um, actually uh, uh, the, the, the position of Somalia, the federal state, has been different from the positions of Puntland, Somaliland. So you can imagine how, uh, how dividing these uh, uh, kind of Arab internal conflicts on Africa, and this again brings the, the, the point of exporting Arab internal conflicts to the Horn of Africa in particular and Africa in general, uh, creating unnecessary divisions and potential sources of, of uh, more instability in the region. Um, of course, there is much talk, I think, and little rigorous uh, research on the impact of, of religious associations and organizations and how they radicalize uh, particular groups in, in, in Africa and how they affect the um, uh, what we can call the African version of Islam, whatever you call it. And we thought this was clear in, in, a, in a remark made by uh, the Ethiopian Prime Minister Ali Ahmed um, recently in the States when he said that, well, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed of the UAE told him that we're going to finance, you know, Islamic schools in Ethiopia. Um, and uh, Abi Ahmed told him, we do not need you to teach us Islam because you have lost it. So this again, I mean, brings the, the issue of history 
the impact of you know um, you know, Arab associations, religious associations, and also particular states sponsoring these uh, uh, associations, and, and how they actually affect the uh, you know the Islam and its practice in the, in the African continent. So here, here again, we cannot deny history and its impact. But the problem, I think, uh, with these implications, is that some countries may have shown a degree of agency. So coming back to, to the approach that I talked about at the beginning of, of, of my talk, we cannot actually ignore the agency of some of these countries. And the fact that we have many players mean that countries like Djibouti or Somalia, even you know small states and fragile states, can actually play the, these regional and international powers off against each other. And we have seen that in cases of, of, of uh, uh, Somalia, um, in, in cases of, of Djibouti, as I said, shifting alliances from, uh, from one party to the other in the, in the, in the Middle East conflict. Um, we have seen that in how Ethiopia, for instance, managed to you know, strike a deal with the UAE in developing the, the port of uh, Barbara in, in, in Somaliland, acquiring a 19% share in the port. So we have a certainly a degree of agency from these countries. But the question is that we cannot actually kind of anticipate that these countries with all these the historical tensions, I mean the Horn of Africa countries, can actually collectively negotiate with either the, Arab, you know, the Arabs, Gulf countries, or, or, or other powers um, in order to defend their collective interests. And, and this is, I think, one of, one of the problems when we deal with the, with the African response to where this increased um, you know, uh, interest of, especially from Gulf monarchies in the region. Uh, one of the interesting things that I have focused on in, in my recent research, as I mentioned, is the economic side of the um, um, Arab role in Africa, especially uh, again Gulf countries. Um, and it's not only touching on, on uh, food and food security, but it's extending to, to energy, uh, to water. Uh, and so it's, you know, food investments are also water investments, and, and, and the, the two sides are actually quite problematic. And the whole thing, of, though it did not start with the international you know, food crisis in 2007, 2008, but it's actually increased with this, with this uh, factor. So as you can see from, uh, from this graph, I mean, the top um, you know, destinations for the um, um, Arab agricultural investments, of course, these are only the planned investments, and there is a, always a huge gap between the planned and the implemented years. But out of the top 10 destinations of, uh, of, of our uh, 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 business uh, uh, projects um, in the world are actually in um, um, Africa and in East Africa in particular. So starting from Sudan, which is first, and then Ethiopia, which is fourth, and Egypt, which is fifth. Okay. And as I will see, I mean, the, 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 I mean there are many dilemmas that have, have actually associated with, with this role. Um, so it's, yes, it's an economic role, but it's also used for political leverage. It's also used for political influence. There is an involvement that is uh, uh, evident, in, especially in Sudan, from uh, you know almost most uh, Gulf countries. And from our own research, uh, uh, the chapter with, with Anna Kaskel and, and Mark Zaytun that I mentioned earlier, uh, we have traced the support of, of different Gulf countries uh, uh, to major um, uh, hydraulic projects in Sudan, the Marwe Dam constructed in 2009, the heightening of the Roseros Dam in 2013, and the Kenana Sugar Company. And we found that most of the you know, uh, sovereign wealth funds uh, of, of Gulf countries or collective funds like you know, the Islamic Development Bank, or the Bank or OPEC Fund and so on have contributed greatly to, this, to these investments. Um, Leaving Sudan to, uh, to, to Ethiopia, we also uh, uh, documented um, you know, increasing Saudi investment, reaching about 3 billion US dollars in, in, in different sectors, including in agriculture. Um, a more problematic role of, of Saudi Arabia, which showed interest in the um, energy produced by the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is a very controversial project, causing tensions between Egypt and, and Ethiopia but also some growing cotton investment uh, in, in Ethiopia. The problems with, with, with these investments, with this economic presence, is that it's actually contributing to the already complicated tense situation between, as I mentioned, 
Egypt on the one hand and uh, Ethiopia on the other hand, and, and the Nile Basin. It has contributed to the you know, change in the balance of power in favor of Ethiopia and in this favor of, of Egypt. It's, um, it, it actually a affected also the, and, and that's why I'm saying, well, it's an economic presence, but, but, but one that has also political implications. Uh, so these economic leverage has, has been used vis-a-vis um, um, -vis countries about Sudan uh, um, uh, in order to, as I mentioned before, change its, its um, uh, position uh, uh, from Iran to supporting uh, Saudi Arabia. And even, you know, uh, uh, pressure that are being, you know, pursued on, on, on some African countries, general East African countries in particular, um, like in the case, uh, for instance, of pressuring these countries to change their position uh, on the suspension of Egypt from the African Union. As you may have known, Egypt was suspended after the military takeover. Uh, Egypt was, in 2013, Egypt was suspended for a year. In, uh, from the AU, and one of the reasons for why Egypt returned back after this year is, uh, uh, this was documented by various resources, is the pressure that was pursued by countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE on African countries in order to accept Egypt back. So there is an influence for this involvement on the foreign policies of African countries in general, East African countries in particular. And then it's also interesting to see how Gulf countries have used these tools of influence in, in, in different directions for different purposes. So sometimes they will even use this, uh, uh, these investments as a political card against Egypt. And the Saudis used that. There were times of you know, disagreements between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia actually showed interest in the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, even you know, with high level officials visiting the site of the dam and you know, discussing how which, which is now uh, being discussed at the level of the GCC, um, you know, importing uh, uh, power produced by, by the dam in order to di diversify the resources of, of energy in, in Gulf countries. So it has been used, I mean, sometimes against other African countries, sometimes against Egypt. And again, we can, we can imagine how this actually complicates the picture, which is already complicated in the Nile Basin. It's interesting from, from, from this map to note, although focus on water, food, energy uh, in, in, uh, in my last slide here. And um, what's interesting is to see how diversify the um, uh, uh, investments of Gulf countries in Africa are. So you can see that I mean, these are basically in agricultural investment, but also in telecom. And you can see that it's extending not only uh, in the uh, uh, direct neighborhood of the, uh, of the Arabs in, in East Africa, but also to, to West Africa with different investments, especially by the UAE in countries like Mali, Niger, Ghana, uh, you know, Burkina Faso, and other uh, Western countries. And, and for, 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 uh, uh, I mean, for Gulf countries, it's, it's actually kind of a, uh, uh, you know, rising Africa with a, with a, you know, increasing consumer base and thus m many opportunities for, uh, for, you know, Gulf businesses to do in, in uh, different African countries. Again, based on, on the Economist Intelligence Unit, they also documented involvement in other areas, in banking, in retail, in travel and tourism, but less, which is important, less and less in industry. That's why these investments are not really transforming or contributing to transforming the economies of African countries. They are kind of being directed to the same uh, you know, uh, sector that other international powers are, are investing in Africa, um, um, based very much on you know, quick, easy profits, rather than long-term uh, sort of investment that contribute to the building the capacities of African economies. If you look at trade, what's interesting here is that if we exclude oil exports, we find that Gulf countries are actually uh, uh, one of the major partners to, so this is the problem of technology. <laughs> okay, so um, we will find that, well, Gulf countries are actually uh, one of the main partners for for uh, the whole of Africa uh, in, 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 in terms of trade, which is also uh, quite an interesting fact, especially in livestock, uh, you know, um, livestock exports from countries like Somalia uh, um, and other countries of the region to the Gulf make this, uh, this trade quite 
quite significant. Looking at the, uh, uh, the ODA, uh, um, how much aid um, Africa is receiving from, from Arab countries, we will find that, interestingly, it's different from the, the uh, kind of the uh, mode of investment. So whereas investments are basically going to countries like Ethiopia for the obvious reasons of you know, the rising Ethiopian economy, um, aid is basically going to uh, countries like Djibouti, um, if you compare the, the figures, and of course to a uh, country like, like Sudan uh, for the uh, for important um, historic and strategic uh, uh, reasons. Um, but if we look at, at, at Somalia, which is quite an interesting example because comparing what Somalia is receiving from, from Gulf countries uh, you know, combined, um, it's, it's much less than what this country, which is in need of, of you know, Arab financial support, is receiving from a country like Turkey, for instance, another, another regional power which is increasing its presence in the region. So whereas Somalia has received about one billion US dollars since 2011 from, from Turkey, it has received um, something like 23 million US dollars from, uh, from, uh, from Gulf countries combined. So I think this tells a lot about, you know, where Gulf countries are actually investing and where they are providing their support. Uh, so, so let me just conclude and wrap up uh, by, by kind of basic uh, um, remarks, but coming back to my question on whether the Arabs have transformed the relationship with Africans into one of partnership for Africa's development. And As we have seen, the point that I tried to make uh, for my presentation is how the involvement is now much more diversified. The Arab involvement in Africa um, is, is now much more diversified in, in economic terms and, and in political terms. But this does not mean that it's following a long-term strategy of contributing to African development and peace. As I have seen from, uh, from you know, strategic political involvement in, in setting military bases, the investments in land, which also uh, means use of you know, water, energy resources, is, is, is somehow called kind of problematic involvement with sometimes uh, uh, potential destabilizing impact. Uh, the second is, I think one of the reasons why there is no kind of, of long-term uh, strategizing of these relations is that these relations have always been trilateral, so always being shaped and affected by third party. This was, you know, the European colonialist and the uh, 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 you know, from the 15th uh, century onwards, um, Israel uh, in, in, in the you know after independence, Iran uh, at some point, and now even you know uh, Qatar versus Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So this is one of the reasons why I mean there is no kind of, of strategizing that only if, I mean that are only driven by the two groups. And finally, I think I've not spoken much about this point, but I think this is a point that you know, uh, uh, calls for further research, that although the relations are now more diversified, they're responding to different regional international variables, they are sti they're still very much state-driven. And I think for a more sustainable relations, we have to look at roles played by civil society, by you know, the private sector. And I think this is one of the ways in which we can be speaking about you know, long-term relations rather than short-term uh, you know relation to serve specific interests. Thank you very much uh, for coming and thank you for This, uh, um, uh, of this session, and that presents me with several problems. Number one, this is clearly a contemporary uh, account um, by a very, very uh, skilled and impressive political scientist. I'm an historian, you know, <laughs> number one. Number two, I work on Asia and on China, okay? Uh, so that's another uh, challenge. <laughs> 
But I think that, you know, uh, Professor Tarfi made it uh, very, very uh, useful in order to open it, to open the discussion, actually, in looking at, you know, various uh, things uh, that might be going on. So I have a series of comments um, and additions uh, from a historian's perspective, from an Asian perspective. And um, I will also add something that I um, happen only, I, maybe I begin with that in the, in, in the past 24 hours. Okay, so my first reaction would be, and this is, I hear it for the first time, um, my first reaction would be actually something that happened yesterday um, that really, really support the arguments that we heard here. Um, yesterday, the uh, president of Chad landed in Tel Aviv um, and had an official, is right now had an official visit uh, um, in Jerusalem. Um, and this was uh, quite uh, remarkable to see um, uh, to see this, uh, to, to see this happening, you know, after you know, in, in light of the very, very fraught, you know, relationship uh, that Israel had with uh, various African, uh, various African countries, you know, that as we have heard, have been shaped and have had in their own impact on the relationship uh, between the Arab world and uh, um, and uh, various African uh, countries. So that's one uh, one thing that truly support what's going on. I interestingly enough. At the same report that the Israeli press was reporting on the visit of the president of Chad, they were also reporting that you know um, Israel and Bahrain might be moving to um, to uh, uh, having uh, uh, more open relations, and there might be a, a sec an official visit of an Israeli prime minister in in Al Bahrain. Yes, following the visit in in Oman. Okay, that. Um, clearly shows, you know, that we really need to think, as we heard now, you know, the whole idea about the age of solidarity. Okay, um, the, the, probably there's much. There's, if you think for a, if you're looking for a quintessential indication, that would be it. Number one, you know, the, the independent foreign policies, you know, driven by economy and by you know anti-Iranian, uh, um, anti-Qatari, anti-this, anti-that interest in the region by various Gulf countries, okay? Um, Qatar's behavior, you know, um, for me, you know, Qatar is the, it should be likened to, to Romania in, in, in the, during the time of the Warsaw Pact. You know, it's part of the Soviet, Soviet bloc, but it maintains its own international uh, foreign policy at the same time. Um, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean that, there's, that the Qataris are, you know, have anything to do with Ceausescu, but I'm talking about, you know, the role it plays within a bloc that we assume should be, should be uh, united. Al Bahrain and the UAE clearly, and Saudi Arabia clearly, they, they change their, have their own ideas, and, you know, far, I can't think of anything more distant than, you know, Arab, uh, um, any notion of Arab solidarity that has existed uh, in the past. Okay? And it is interesting to see how the ways in which this translates itself into international relations is by looking at Africa. Okay. So this is my uh, contemporary comment, and of course I have to mention this given you know, the, the, the immediacy of the situation. The president of Chad maybe just left Israel uh, a few hours ago. Okay. So this is like really an indication of how it is. Okay. Now let's go back to history. Um, as I was trying to guess, what you will be talking about, you know, and from a historic point of view. So I spent um, the weekend and this morning reading a little bit about the, uh, about the region and reviewing, I must admit, you know, my own work as an undergrad when I was still interested in uh, these uh, topics before I went uh, to, look at, uh, to look at China. Okay. Um, and then I remembered uh, this, uh, I didn't have time to prepare it, to prepare an image there, but I will circle in a minute. Then I remembered that cartoon. Okay. That cartoon was published in Cairo in, um, 19, uh, in 1927, okay. um, right uh, three years after the visit of Rastafari uh, McConnell in, uh, in, 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 in Cairo. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to separate it in a minute, but what you see here is you see Egypt as a, um, as a you see here Egypt is a modernizing power. Yes, this is in Kashkur, which I, uh, I don't think exists anymore, but it used to be a very, very good uh, thing. This uh, man here is a clearly a, waft, a, a politician from al waft probably Saad, I don't know, you know, maybe Rafa Raya can comment on that later. And this is uh, uh, Rastafari, the leader of Ethiopia, you know, uh, being courted by the Egyptians, 
but you know the image there is even goes even much uh, 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 much better. You know, first of all, Egypt is a modernized dress, uh, 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 is, a, is a almost as a Western woman. You know, uh, standing there, you know, as a modernizing agent in the region. Yes, uh, on one hand, um, also trying to court, you know, Ethiopia, the king of Ethiopia, um, um, by you know, uh, as part of the national uh, politics, and of course, you have here. Um, you have here, you know, a, a nationalist Egyptian politician, you know, trying to do that. Now, pay attention here that despite the long history of, uh, um, of uh, a fraught relations between Ethiopia and Egypt, maybe you can circulate that so you can all enjoy this very rare uh, uh, cartoon. Okay, as I said, 19, 1927 Cairo. I mean, you see the Rastafari is hugging, you know, let's call him Saad. I don't think it's Saad, but let's call him Saad, you know, and hugging the, the, Egyptian, uh, uh, the Egyptian politician, okay? That was, I think that cartoon speaks to, let me go very quickly about this, about this story, okay? That story comes at the moment where, you know, Egypt um, actually tried to reshape its relationship with the entire Nile Basin, okay? Um, and particularly with Ethiopia, because Ethiopia is so important. Just think about you know the origins of the Nile. You know this is uh, uh, um, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Uh, there are some very important lakes in Ethiopia that are part of part of the Nile, and you know it is a major, major, major Egyptian uh, concern. Not only that, let us remember, yes, that the, the relationship are even more fraught because you know the beginning, the, the, the decisive event in 19th century Egyptian history and Ethiopian history is of course the defeat in the Battle of Gura, where, you know, in 1870 or 1876, when, you know, Egypt attacked Ethiopia, was defeated, yes, um, and memories were still very, very, uh, uh, very, very strong memories of this defeat, okay. Now, in, an, in the 20th century, what we see, we see the two countries trying to get together, even negotiate questions of water, which, uh, by the way, like, come up very, very strong. I've been schooling me, myself on this in the past few days, you know. And, you know, this, the, the, the peak moment of that is that cartoon and, that, and the visit that happened before, three years before, of Rastafari in Ethiopia, in, in Cairo. What happened? How this little tale ended? It ended because the British interfered. The British wanted to uh, mess with the Ethiopians on their own hand, and they wanted to actually build a dam in Lake Tana, in the Ethiopian part of the, of the Nile. A dam that, by the way, would have been a much better dam than the, than the, uh, the Nasser building in Aswan in 56, you know, for the entire region, in terms of its uh, capacity to produce, in terms of control of, uh, of water. And basically what did they want to do, they're going to say, oh, we're going to build the dam, and then we're basically going to turn Ethiopia into a British protectorate that will be controlled from Khartoum. Yes. That messed things up, okay? and uh, uh, um, it soured all the relationship. It, and even though the Egyptians were really wanted to come closer to Ethiopia, it is British interference in Egypt and in the region that ruined this. Now, I'm not making a usual argument that you hear here um, uh, uh, in certain quarters about, oh, the West just uh, messed everything up, okay? Um, African countries or Middle Eastern countries were coming together, you know, and then showed up the West, basically France, France or, or, or Britain, and uh, um, really uh, destroys everything in the story relationship. But in this case, you can really put the finger and say like, okay, this was uh, something that uh, uh, went really, really wrong because of that particular interference. You know, the whole episode ended up, you know, with the Abyssinia crisis in 1935. Now, it was striking that w the first image that Professor Tafik showed us is that exactly that you have that, it, it, uh, Nasser's new African policy tries to reverse that, you know, the, the, if, you, if we now focus on three decades, you know, from the 50s to today, actually, the, the moment that we saw Nasser coming in is like actually Nasser tried to reverse the sour history of the, the previous six, six, uh, six decades, you know, or the previous four decades, from the 20s all the way to the, all the, way, uh, 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 to the 50s. I can talk about it forever because I've been schooling myself over that. Let's move on to another uh, dimension that I would add here. Of course, Islam is important, okay? Uh, the person who made the match between us two is Professor Gomez, who's recently, uh, I had to comment on his book, African Dominion, that talks about, you know, the fact that 
the, the, the fact that you know Africa is a very very important you know uh, economic power in the early modern period and in the late medieval period, let's say 14th century uh, on. But one of the things that I zoomed in in my comment is the is the centrality of King Musa. Okay, um, when King Musa come, King Musa was the richest man in the in the world. Um, it, he was in I think in today's Mali. Um, uh, um, in today's world, and he comes to Egypt, uh, um, and he was uh, a very, very important, uh, very important person. He comes to Egypt for a historic visit in the in the 15th century, and among all the other commentaries, they comment, you know, that he's probably the most handsome man in the world. This is how much people paid attention to this uh, visit. So you had you, that visit occurs on two things, you know, shared African interests. Yes. Um, that actually are produced because Sub-Saharan Africa is the important economic power of the world at the time. Okay, if you think about Ibn Battuta and his travels, you know he knows why he's doing. You know, when he leaves Morocco, he goes down first of all to these areas, and then he continues all the way, uh, um, all the way to Mecca, and from there, of course, to China. Um, that's why I love Ibn Battuta so much. You know, this is a very important medieval traveler um, um, from Morocco, from Tanger. So um, the part of the thing I think that happens here, that affects here, you know, this is from the historical point of view, is Africa's power, you know, dwindling power in the modern period affects its relationship with the, with the, with the Arab world, certainly with Egypt, but later on with the Arab world, in terms of the dependencies and so on. Because when Africa was strong, when Africa was a very, very important economic power and a very important Islamic power, okay, it was different. Okay. Now, Islam is also plays here a, a, a very important role in terms of you know the, the his historical dimension, and I would wonder now. I think I think it resonates with the comment that you said that you know uh, the UAE tries to come to uh, uh, I forgot who it was um, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Yeah, you said well you have forgot about uh, you, you know, you have lost your Islam. Okay. Now let us not forget. Uh, let us now let me just make a final comment on that. Okay, before I ask one more question. Um, it, African Islam is, is, is very important. If you think about you know, the, the, the destruction of the centers of Islam after the Mongol invasion, after Hulubu's destruction of Baghdad in 1258, uh, and you think, where do Islamic sciences, yes, both sciences that are Islamic and, is, uh, and the, sciences, the sciences that Muslims engage in, they travel to Timbuktu, where you have one of the largest Arab and largest African and largest Islamic uh, uh, libraries that is still being recovered. Okay? And there's a reason why they go there. There where the wealth is concentrating, where the trade is concentrating, a lot of Islamic scholarship is moving away from the Middle East to a place you know, where it can relocate, uh, relocate itself. That also has an effect about that. Final point here is, of course, in the Horn of Africa, you know, African jurists you know, and African Islamic scholars were routinely coming to Al-Azhar. Okay, we get exercise about Al-Azhar as a center for the Islamic world, but we forget that the Islamic world has a very, very serious sub-Saharan uh, 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 dimension. You know, Islam is an African religion as much as it is a Middle Eastern religion and South Asian, uh, uh, South Asian and Asian religion. Yes. My final comment in, in, in a series of reactions to this, and I can't help. Okay, I began with, you know, Western interference. I mentioned Western interference as one, as one example. But this is a different Africa because what we see now is a massive Chinese um, intervention in, um, in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in Africa. Massive, okay? Scholar, I am a scholar of uh, uh, Islam in China, and you know, one of the things that I work a lot is, you know, of course, the, the big uh, uh, expedition uh, of Cheng He, the, the Muslim admiral um, of the early 15th century, that actually makes it to Africa, and we have a lot of archaeological evidence now that we find it really support that. You know, it's part of you know. At that time, it was about remapping the Indian Ocean, but in many ways, you know, the comeback of these expeditions that happened 600 years ago, the way the Chinese government uses them today, you know. Uh, shows, you know, it's, it's very strong interest in Africa, particularly in railroads, but also in minerals and so on. And you mentioned marine uh, ports. There is one in Djibouti, uh, very, very close to the American one, etc., etc., etc. So the question is, you know, if we think about, you know, this trio of, you know, African states, um, Arab states, and then, you know, the West, you know, maybe now it is time to actually rethink, rethink, the, the, rethink the globe and think about a different uh, situation. 
a situation in which we have you know African states, Arab states, no more solidarity, only only political and, 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 and economic interests. By the way, I should have mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned, the Israeli press but yesterday was very open. I mean, it was always strikingly open about the fact that, you know, the whole relationship with Chad is about weapons. You know, we send them weapons and they buy weapons, etc., etc. They almost even say how the, the Chadians use their weapons. Yes, it was quite striking. Now, let me go back to China and that, let me go back. If you think about if you think about what's going on, and you see this also because of the Gulf, the involvement of the Gulf states, and you know the old, old Indian Ocean trade routes, it were always there for millennia before the Mediterranean uh, became suddenly again important, or before the Atlantic. You know, you see the certain corridors that go all the way back to India and then to China, and you see interferences first of the Chinese, but now also the Indians and the Japanese in Africa. How this is going to come up and play here? You know, can we continue to think about, you know, Arab, uh, Afro-Arab relations without that dimension, given, you know, how massive and how decisive uh, uh, it, it's going to be. So, I'll uh, stop here, and uh, I thank you again for a wonderful, yeah, yeah, I was sitting here and everything got organized for me, you know, like in the past 600 years, not only six decades. <laughs> Any questions? I'll serve as a moderator. Please, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this really uh, brilliant presentation. It was uh, very well organized and uh, really uh, covered, I think, uh, all of the topics that uh, is involved in Afro-Arab uh, relations. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you one thing that you didn't talk much about, uh, if at all, was the um, situation with regard to <coughs> Libya and uh, Libya's involvement in Africa, because uh, at some point, Gaddafi kind of gave up on the Arabs, and uh, he turned his attention to Africa, and he uh, invested a great deal into Africa and uh, in the organization of African unity. And as I understand it, uh, even his bodyguards were uh, not uh, Libyan. They were uh, from uh, uh, Africa. So um, what, how do you think that played out? Uh, what do you think uh, he was up to? Because he certainly understood that there was a, a, an African dimension to um, Libyan uh, existence and, and uh, future. So that's my question. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll take another one and then we'll go. Yes, please. Well, I wanted to go back to the trade slide. And a couple of slides earlier showing how. Uh, yes, yes, you just asked this one. I was wondering if you could comment or give us an explanation how come the old massive investment that are happening in recent years, you feel that there's a decline of the exports going to the UAE, if I interpret it right, uh, to, the, you know, to the Gulf areas, generally speaking. How do you interpret that? On one hand. And on the other hand, I was wondering, uh, what was the perceived sentiment, if there's any sentiment on the street or on the ground among in those African countries, popular sentiment, mm -hmm. do they feel the, this intrusion or this militarization or this involvement? I mean, what do they feel about it? Is there a uniform one, or does it vary from a country to another, or are they too busy surviving? And then thirdly, uh, generally speaking, there's a G there's, there's GDP per country, there is a rate of analphabetism per country, etc. Are those intrusions resulting in any improvement in those metrics at the World Health Standard, if you know of? Because you said there are no long-term long -term plans, it's just... Well, thank you so much. Uh, um, and well, thank you very much for complimenting. As I said, I'm not a historian, so I, uh, I did not speak much about history. And, uh, and, and so thanks for, for complimenting. Well, that's why, my, uh, that's why uh, it's a good man. Yeah. My, yeah. Complimenting my, my presentation with this uh, rich historical, historical analysis. Um, uh, just very quick, brief uh, sort of responses to, uh, to, to what you said. I think it had 
always been problematic. I mean, you, you, you spoke about the, the, the impact of, uh, of um, you know, British colonialism and how Nasser uh, tried to reverse uh, the, the, the history of, of Egypt's involvement in Africa. But I think even here, if you're interested, I'll be talking uh, this evening in, in Columbia University, particularly on, on Egypt's policy. So even at the time of Nasser, there was, it was problematic, even at, at the level of discourse. And if you looked at the Nasser's philosophy of the revolution, he was very much referring to, you know, uh, carrying the, the, you know, civilization to the jungles of Africa and so on. So it has always been a kind of problematic, and uh, one has to admit that. Um, the role of Islam, I think, is the same. I mean, some people, in, in, uh, in, including uh, Mazrui or uh, noted Egyptian historians who actually even uh, um, um, had an official role in, in supporting the role of, of liberation movements in, in Africa, um, are, are actually very much uh, like to speak about that in terms of social history and you know interactions between cultural interactions between Arabs and Africans, rather than really uh, you know one impact going from one direction only to, to the other. Um, but again, I mean, historically and contemporarily, I think uh, 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 there has been problematic aspects of that. And, and yeah. as we know, uh, my comment on the on the contemporary involvement is, as I said, I mean, we have lots of talk about you know the, the radicalizing impact of of you know organizations, state and non-state uh, organizations coming uh, you know uh, um, uh, to you know uh, build. Islamic schools and so on in Africa, <coughs> but I think this this is a, an area of research that has to be you know, researched in a, in a regular way because I've not seen um, kind of really research based on on, on you know uh, field work uh, to, to to test or assess this impact. So, th so this is something that is problematic but needs uh, needs more research. Um, the role of other actors trying to include, of course. Yes, it's um, um, as I tried to mention. It has always been, you know, a relation affected by other parties. But I think uh, the bo point was that I was trying to make is how the two regions, even if we take them, uh, I mean, Arab countries as such and, and, and African, they have not actually managed to kind of construct a vision on how to deal with these interventions. So, for instance, when we speak about the Chinese involvement and, and the big. Belt and Road Initiative now, you know, and what does that mean in terms of the connections between Arabs and Africans? What does that mean in terms of infrastructure projects? Because the Horn of Africa actually features very prominently in this initiative, uh, and other countries are, are seeking to, to benefit from it as well. But I think Egypt is trying to propose, you know, the, the new economic uh, zone of the Suez Canal, for instance, uh, in order to mobilize support, and it's, it's claiming that this will actually also be good for Africa. But how can this be good for Africa? This is, this is the question. And I don't think there is a kind of a collective thinking at the, you know, at the official level and how, how, how there can be kind of a, 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 a collective response to that kind of, of intervention. But I agree that, well, there has to be new terms of engagement. Um, Libya, and I think it's, it's, it's a very important uh, uh, point, I, I try kind of to uh, avoid speaking about you know foreign policies of specific countries, but, but of course the Libyan role was quite uh, was quite significant and important. And as you mentioned, I mean it was very much driven by the disappointment from the Arabs and the uh, 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 support, the African support to Libya against sanctions, against international sanctions, which proved to be more outspoken compared to Arab countries. And even if we see uh, interestingly how this again relates to, to my point about you know. Whether we have, whether we still can speak about, you know, collective Afro relations, the uh, responses and the positions on the NATO intervention in Libya to overthrow Gaddafi or to to make sure that, uh, that Gaddafi is overthrown after the the, the you know, popular uprisings, uh, it was actually quite uh, interesting to to see the difference between the Arab world and and Africa. So for the Africans, it was basically trying to uh, employ African solutions to African problems, sending President Jacob Zuma in order to mediate in, in, the, in, in the conflict, while Arab countries supported, uh, especially countries like Egypt, for instance, supported uh, NATO's military intervention in, in Libya, 
which had kind of the catastrophic impact that we're seeing today. Now, I'm not saying that this was right and this was wrong. My point is that even in this situation, there was a, a great difference between the African position and the Arab position. Now, the problem, of course, with, with, with Gaddafi is his very much, um, I would say, uh, unrealistic sort of visions of African integration, and that's why he was not taken seriously by you know, uh, countries like South Africa, the regional powers, and so on. And his proposals were taken uh, uh, by degree of you know, uh, caution uh, by other African countries. And it was also kind of a model, we have to say, of this checkbook diplomacy, right? Uh, paying for the uh, you know, uh, uh, subscriptions of, of uh, other African countries in order to allow them to uh, vote for the transformation of the OEU into the AU, in addition to massive investment in some African countries, um, and including a debate now on, on you know, freezing the assets of uh, Libya or you know, retrieving the, assets, the Libyan assets uh, from a country like South Africa, for instance. So yes, uh, I mean, he had a, a kind of a certain vision for, for African integration. He invested a lot, and that was driven, as I said, by, by the uh, disappointment from the Arab world. Um, and uh, interestingly, I think from, uh, from the, the leaks um, um, of, of you know, discussions between the Americans, especially uh, Hillary Clinton, and the Italians. I mean, one of the reasons why uh, there was this intervention to uh, overthrow Gaddafi uh, was his involvement in Africa. So that was that was um, uh, evident from from the, the, the leaks between the, the Americans and the Italians uh, in preparation for the for the NATO intervention. Um, now coming to, to to the other interesting questions, um, I don't think actually about about the point of of uh, uh, why, so speaking basically about the period from 2015 to now, um, what I know is that we're part of the, of the, uh, you know, the exports uh, to um, Gulf countries are actually for re-export from the UAE. Um, um, this may be kind of related to uh, some sort of uh, international slowdown in, 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 you know, in trade in general, but I have to check that. I, I did not kind of think through why in particular would in the period from, uh, from um, 2014 uh, to uh, uh, you know, onwards there has been uh, this kind of decline. Um, your second question was about the popular reactions to, uh, to, this, to this involvement. I don't think there is really, uh, there, there has not been kind of surveys conducted. So the Afrobarometer, for instance, were, uh, 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 has done surveys on what Africans think about Chinese involvement, for instance. But what do, do they think about the, the um, um, African involvement? I think it's, it's again, it has to be taken, of course, at the bilateral level. So uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, reactions to uh, you know, Egypt's and Egypt's policy, for instance, um, there were references to how, for instance, the military overthrow of, of President Morsi in, in 2013 left some negative impacts at the popular level on how Egypt sees political Islam and how Egypt is actually acting against any kind of, you know, uh, any kind of movement of political Islam, even if, uh, uh, you know, peaceful, um, how this is actually being very negatively seen in a number of, of African countries. But again, no, no rigorous kind of research or surveys done um, in order to, you know, assess the perceptions. Uh, at the official level, as I've said, I mean, the involvement of a country like the UAE in, in Somaliland, for instance, is very much irritating to Somalia and, the, and, and, and at, the, at the level of, you know, of the parliament, the Somali uh, parliament has actually made it clear that it's actually rejecting this kind of the UAE presence in Somaliland. So this is kind of also touching the, the you know, the popular responses. But I think there has to be more and more done about the, uh, the, the, you know, the response to each and every involvement by each and every power, because obviously Saudi involvement is very much different from Egyptian involvement or from the UAE involvement. Your last question, you've been talking about health. Uh, the GDP growth, the economic advances that go hand in hand with those different, I mean, you, you did show in another map that they have the distribution yeah. of funding all around Africa. 
we have examples where you can see projects implemented by you know specific countries creating hundreds of thousands of, of uh, job opportunities. Uh, but I mean, we cannot disaggregate this to know uh, exactly you know the, the impact of, of each involvement. And as I said, one of the problems is that there is a big gap between also the the planned projects and the implemented projects. Uh, we know that well. This is the the heavy involvement of of our countries economically in 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 a number of African countries is part of as I said trying to uh, to make use of the of the improving investment climate and economic climate. Uh, but I mean to claim that this has I mean in particular contributed to yes it has contributed to job creation. But what kind of job creation? Again, looking at the sectors, um, it's uh, not labor intensive uh, uh, kind of sector that is attracting the um, uh, most other investments. So if you look at telecoms, for instance, uh, um, agriculture investment, I think it's, uh, as I said, there's a huge gap between the planned and the implemented projects. But industries which are actually creating more and more jobs are not actually attracting the investment of, of, of Arab countries. So there's no assessment that can say, well, that this has contributed. Of course, we have seen you know, uh, rise in a number of African economies in Ethiopia and Rwanda and Cote d'Ivoire and other countries with fastest growing economies in the last decade. And part of that story is attracting foreign investments, including from Arab countries, right? But one has to, uh, I think, take this with a with, with kind of caution because, yeah. Um, yeah. Please. Um, Function with certain families. Each yeah. country counts 20 families that benefit from all the deals. Yeah. I was wondering once again whether, unfortunately, perhaps in Africa, it's also those investments are functioning through a groomy families, and, well, and as such, the, the benefit is not even frequent even for yeah. those populations. Uh, and, I, and this does not stop, nonetheless, in parallel, the heavy investment <coughs> of those countries. I think generalizations, yes, uh, I will say yes and no. Of course, it's based on that. And that's why I'm, I, I refer to the uh, uh, missing or the absence of the private sector. Because, I mean, the nature of the economies of Gulf countries mean that, well, these investments are basically by uh, royals or people connected to royals. Uh, this is simply the, the nature of the economy of, of, these, of these countries. You will not find, you know, uh, 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 evident cases of big businesses, pri totally purely private businesses moving into Africa. I mean, there has to be some kind of, of political backing or support and involvement. The same even for a country like Morocco. If you if you look at you know Moroccan investments in, in different countries of, of Africa, especially in West Africa, it's basically by the king and, and his associates. So, well, it's it's, uh, it's it's evident. But I think also generalizations are, are, um, are difficult because. Speaking, for instance, with, with Egyptian businesses uh, investing in land in, in Sudan, only a few of them, but they, they refer to the difference between the Egyptian model and the Gulf model, saying whether well, the Gulf model, where they have you know, the financial lodges to invest, not only in land, but you know, in building infrastructure, schools, social services for the community that they are targeting. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's it, again, it's, it's going to be very hard to generalize. It's, it's even not should be, I think, research not only at the bilateral level, but even at the level at the level of specific projects. And the problem with that, well, these countries are very secretive. I mean, last week we know that uh, I mean, a, a British scholar was uh, was arrested in the UAE for researching, you know, UAE uh, policy in in Yemen. So I think, I mean. Looking at the investment of these countries, I mean, it's, it's, it's becoming very risky, and that's why maybe one of the reasons why people are not kind of closely investigating uh, the investments of these countries in, uh, in, in, uh, in different African regions. Um, uh, um, uh, third follow up on that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, please, sir. Thank you, Professor Dr. Uh, very much. I arrived late, so I may have missed this, but I'm interested, and this is an unfair question, I'm interested in how you define. Arab and African, you speak of an Arab position and an African position. Um, are you speaking of Arab League states? Because many of them are also members of the African, uh, the African Union. Um, and also, you're speaking of Arab states, many of them have large non-Arab populations, Mauritania, Somalia, Djibouti, Morocco, and so on. And um, so I'm interested in the definitions, how you, uh, 
fine. And also in terms of politics of solidarity, you had a discourse of solidarity in the 70s, but beneath that you had real politics and geopolitical unity. So I'm interested to see, today there's a, a new discourse of solidarity, Algeria, Morocco, partly in response to the collapse of Libya and the refugee flows. They're very much stressing their African side, their African culture. Mm -hmm. There's a revival of even Batuta. There's uh, much Berber nationalism and so on. I'm wondering if you see a new discourse of solidarity emerging to mask the geopolitics. Um, thank you, very, very interesting question. Well, I kind of deliberately uh, decided not to uh, uh, define the two regions. Um, I have actually put the North African uh, countries very much in the, uh, on the Arab side because, I mean, historically they have been a kind of uh, connecting countries, countries connecting the two regions or trying to, to connect the two regions together. Uh, sometimes problematically, as I mentioned, in borderline countries like Sudan, for instance, which has been used as a showcase of how, you know, the, the relations between Arabs and Africans or the coexistence between Arabs and Africans are, is, is, is quite an issue, is quite a problem. So um, I, I deliberately did not, you know, define the, the two regions. But I mean, uh, as, as, you, as you have seen, I mean, I've tried very much when speaking about the the Arab world to focus maybe more on, on Gulf countries, uh, where now maybe because of the rising uh, political and economic presence in, the, in, in, in Africa in general, and the Horn of Africa in particular. And um, as I speak about Africa, uh, you know, in terms of what are the most, uh, the, the regions that are most, uh, with the most intensive interactions with, with the Arab world. Uh, now, your second question is, is, is quite interesting, but it's also, um, it's also I think, a, 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 um, a discourse that is being invited for a specific reason for a specific period. So Morocco is you know, coming back to the AU. Again, Morocco has, has never been you know, away from Africa, especially West Africa, as I mentioned, in terms of investment, in terms of official visits even to countries in, in East Africa and so on. So Morocco left the AU, but has never left, left African countries in, in, in many respects. But there is an interest now in, you know, as, as you're saying, in, in shaping a, a discourse of, uh, of belonging, not, not solidarity, I think, but, but of belonging, of identity. Same in Egypt, you know, after the shock of suspension from the, the African Union in 2013, I think one of the ways in which Egypt is trying to create a new image in the continent is to say, well, we are connected not only by history, not only by geography, but also by identity because we're Africans. And of course, I mean, the, as you're saying, it's very much used to, uh, part of it to mask um, uh, political realities and, and, and policies uh, that are sometimes uh, problematic, uh, but also, um, as you mentioned, sometimes for, for, for domestic purposes, for, for speaking to specific groups inside. Uh, uh, Again, one has to take that on a case-by-case case, uh, basis. Um, again, looking at the case of Sudan, which decided that, well, uh, let, uh, let the Africans, or at least part of the African South Sudan, secede in order to implement our projects, which, which, which will never be implemented in a country like Sudan. Um, it's very different from, from the case of, of, uh, of other uh, North African countries like Morocco or Algeria. So yes, I mean, the, the general assessment that there may be, yes, in, in the Euda scores, but it has to be taken on a, I think, case-by-case -case basis. Sir. So. Hey, thank you very much um, for this excellent presentation. I was just going to follow up on one question about what, what people think and try to combine it with the rest of the world where we are seeing the rise of um, nationalism and autocratism. And, um, uh, how this is affecting uh, both um, the Arab region and, um, and the African region where we never almost saw any, any democratic movement when it was, it was killed um, almost immediately except for Tunisia, I think. Um, so um, taking Islam a little bit out of the question, can we a little bit focus on uh, nationalism? and uh, how this is affecting Arab countries first and how they affect on, um, on the African countries. Does it exist? Is it on the rise? Um, and um, second question, I think, to both of you, I guess, is the countries which are investing in, uh, in Africa, 
what is the what what's the perception of what's what's their perception and what's the population's perception? Are there any uh, prejudices? Okay, on the African side. On the both sides, actually, why not? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are they patronizing? Or how are the um, reaction of the, the, the local population? Okay. So, um, well, first of all, in, in terms of the rise of, of nationalism and, and the decline of, of uh, any potentials of democratic transformation, I think this uh, this is an important point in my um, well, my presentation again this evening and, and in my work on, on Egypt's foreign policy in in Africa. Uh, I define the the moment of the January 25th revolution in Egypt as a uh, an opportunity that was missed uh, because I mean how it's, it's interesting how uh, um, you know popular movements in other in other African countries saw this movement uh, saw the exceptional movement of the Hair Square and the symbolism of, of, of this movement and how they try to you know build connection and compare this to other popular movements in, in other African countries with people like Mahmoud Mamdani, the noted Ugandan